And uh, yeah, welcome to episode three of the Big Picture Film Club podcast. And um, today I have two very talented guests with me. And um, I was very keen to get you both on the podcast to hear your perspectives, uh, your views on uh, all things film related, but also kind of understanding a bit about what you do. And um, I think a lot of people will be inspired um, by your um, journeys thus far. Um, so I'm here today with Annie Laurie and Anna, Anika Allen. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. And uh, so could you kind of uh, give a bit of a breakdown about what you guys both do? Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, happy to be here, Presh, always. Hey. Big up the Big Picture Film Club. Nice. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a writer-director, hailing from South London. Um, says it all really Hilly from South London <laughs> so you know a bit of a firecracker <laughs> um, I have been directing on and off I guess since 2011 I started off as an actress as a kid so I was on a couple of shows like The Bill yeah. and I remember around the age of 10 I totally wanted to do what everybody else was doing on set so I kind of had a strong sense of connection even though I didn't know what filmmaking was or what a director was really at that age um yeah cut to uh going to film school I made a short film I wrote a play um it was shortlisted I sort of tested my talent if you will and then I went to film school but yeah national film television school and that was cool cool yeah cool <laughs> <laughs> so hi it's Anika here so I'm not necessarily um, a filmmaker, but I've been around the industry and within the creative industry. So I'm Anika. Um, I'm the co-owner of The Colour Network, which is a black entertainment film and TV platform. And I'm also a digital marketeer. And so as my background started off as a journalist and freelance doing that for a number of years. And then kind of decided that journalism wasn't making me enough money in London to pay the bills and keep the lights on. Yeah. So then I um, moved into TV production. So I guess my production knowledge isn't necessarily film, it's more TV. But yeah. essentially the same skills um, apply in terms of making um, a production, I guess. And so worked in TV for a number of years with a lot of independent production companies on a lot of real reality and entertainment formats. Miss Journalism, though, was like, okay, there's not any magazines out here, though, that I felt like I really wanted to write for. So then met my um, old business partner, and we decided to start our own. So we had a mag called Flavor Mag, which was a <laughs> lifestyle magazine, which Fresh Thank actually you featured Flavor in Mag. when he was King Cash as his, his rapper alter e ego <laughs> back in the day. And um, did that for a number of years. And yeah, as, I guess as digital took off, um, it's kind of utilizing those skills to kind of engage your audiences, whether it was people saying, how do I engage young people? How do I engage diverse audiences online? And utilizing that skills to kind of work with different brands to do that. And I guess essentially fast forward to today, and now I kind of work with brands who wanna try and you know engage your audiences online and I guess get a return on investment in the digital aspect of their business, but then also have a new platform called The Color Network. And so that's where I'm at today. Wonderful. Both incredible stories. Um, I kind of wanted to just jump in and understand both being um, women and people Say of colour. Say How has your position uh, been affected or do you feel that's given you thicker skin to deal with situations or has that changed how you operate and what are your, what are your thoughts on that? How has that shaped your journey, do you feel? Oh, it's it's one of those really big questions. And for the past, I think since I graduated for the past two years, I've been uh, fortunate enough and interestingly enough, been part of panel for a whole series of diversity, BAME conversations, particularly with broadcasters and um, brands, private membership clubs and all the rest of it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I don't know that anybody really knows what, that means anymore um it's something that's uh over said and not often actioned well very rarely actioned what and do you mean specifically yeah well i just um so if you so i mean i'm a writer director so let's say 
if you take the numbers that only 13% of working directors in the UK are female, then bring in the question of how many of them are black, brown, Asian, Middle Eastern, yeah. mixed race. I mean, yeah, I I think it would be very few and far between. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a massive question when you're going in having meetings people will speak to you about your your race your age and the fact that you're a female and you have to mm. find a way navigating all three i don't think christopher nolan's ever had those questions thrown at him mm. so i mean yeah it's not an evil play an, an even playing field did i say evil you almost, did. almost. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it's not a yeah yeah it's not but you know i think that i've all i've always been been a navigate I'm a light skinned girl so I've always had to navigate the waters of where I grew up. Yeah. I've got a Moroccan family, I've got a Jamaican family, so there's there's always been and British family, so there's always been a way of kind of, you know, flowing. Yeah. Um I see it every single day in every meeting that I'm in. The the fact that people are just waiting to ask me that very important question that has nothing to do with my feature. Which is, oh, what's your heritage? <laughs> that kind of stuff. <laughs> So um, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Sometimes it's just curiosity. But do I think that the, you know, I don't, I think the numbers are uh, sufficient enough to prove that, uh, yeah, the reason why Lenny Henry keeps talking, Sir Lenny Henry keeps talking about it is because the, the numbers don't meet the conversation. So there's a lot of chat and the numbers are still not being met. Nick, did you kind of feel that same way too? Uh. But the, the numbers aren't being met, or just in just in my experience, just in your personal experience. Um, I guess my personal experience. I remember um, I was working on a production once, and the director walked in and was like, "Oh, you're working with me." And then I started speaking to him, and he's like, "You're a novelty in this industry, and you can't you?" And I said, "What do you mean?" And he's like, "Well, you're black, you're female, and you're from Birmingham." And I was like, wow, and it's and what's funny, I was like, at that time when he said that, I didn't even consider myself being. A novelty. Yeah. Um, I just kind of just got on with the work and just got on with what um whatever I needed to do to get ahead. Yeah. But um, as you kind of go along and you kind of realise actually in very few spaces there will be people that kind of look like you or think like you. Um, I think you kind of become more aware of that. Um, I think initially though it was just more because I just was so eager to get with it into the industry. And then you kind of see that actually it is difficult for people of colour to get in the industry for one because they're not in the same networks as a lot of people that are in the industry from the start. You know, they didn't probably go to the same uni or the same schools or have the same kind of family friends that a lot of the people in the industry mm -hmm. um have had and then also the money thing obviously when you start yeah. off in the industry you're usually at the bottom you might you might be a runner or i don't know production yeah. assistant or something that's very low really low paid and a lot of the people around me that would be working in um production would be like oh yeah my, my daddy bought me a flat so i you know it's it's so i don't you know have really cheap rent or no rent to pay so yeah. they could afford to to do um really menial jobs for very little money until until they work their way up the ladder whereas i'm kind of having to do this as well as other jobs just to to be able to survive in the first place and then i think as um as people of color and our lifestyles growing up are, is a lot different in terms of so one thing i i realized early is that a lot of the my next job i'd probably hear about if i went to the pub or the bar with everybody that i was working with and but Generally, that's not the culture I've grown up with. Like my my mom and my family would be like, "Why are you going to the bar? Why are you drinking?" It wasn't it it, yeah. it wasn't part of what what I was expected to do, and so I I hated being in that environment. But it was something that I'd forced myself to do, and I'd probably like have one drink and maybe then a cranberry juice just to be in that <laughs> <laughs> just to be in that be in that room. There's nothing so wrong I could with hear, <laughs> hear what was what was going on. But um, I definitely think that um, you know, you know behind behind the camera as well as on screen more more things need to be done kind of uh chiming in on that point of networking do you feel both your experiences in that have made you sharper networkers in that regard in kind of knowing how to spot or well, be self-aware in a situation and know who you need to talk to who you need to approach 
I think I was quite fearless when I was um, when I was first getting into the industry. I didn't care who, who who somebody was. I didn't mind going up to them and be like, "Hi, I'm Anika. So, who are you? What do you do?" And things. And so it it wasn't something that um, a lot of people find networking quite hard, or they're going. I probably hate it more now than I actually did then. And is that okay. Mm-hmm. Oh. Uh, continue. Okay, <laughs> I was hearing noise. Sorry. Yeah. Um. So I, I probably um don't dislike doing it more now than I did then when I was younger. I, did, I didn't mind kind of going up to people. I knew that actually you needed to talk to people and be in the room, get people to know who you are because I, they might not think about me the first time. They might not even think about me the second time. But actually, the third, fourth, fifth time they meet me, then actually, then when they have an opportunity, they might think, ah. That young lady we met that's been quite persistent and been at this event and spoken to me a few times. Let's give her a ring or let's, you know, find her. And so um, definitely I think um, networking is an important skill to have within this industry. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with, um, I agree with you. I think it really is. Um, equally, I think you you can't, there's a kind of balance when you when you're a filmmaker because you can't overdo it because you'll reek of desperation. Yeah. So uh, going into a, a space and kind of schmoozing, if you like, is kind of part and parcel of the industry. But it's kind of getting into those very exclusive little clubs sometimes that can be a little bit, you know, takes a bit of navigating. But yeah, you don't want to ever come across as too PRE. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 But you know, I I recently got back from came back from LA, and that's a culture that's very much present yourself, uh, to, to reel off the festivals that your film has been in, and then you know get an elevator pitch of your feature, and it's kind of people expect it almost immediately. But in the UK, there's a kind of old well, European reserved. kind of reserved thing. Yeah. But you know, it's also good to kind of be a rebel and uh, break that rule a little bit. I guess it just depends on the event. Yeah. Like I was, I was at something and David O. Russell was there and I was thinking, I really want to tell him that I'm a filmmaker and talk to him about my <laughs> pedigree and how brilliant it is. And I was like, oh, okay, hold on. There's a lot of people in the space and all I could muster was, hi, my name is Annie. I'm, yeah, I'm a writer, director. Yeah, uh, yeah, I really think your film is cool. <laughs> 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 and I walked Stop. away and I was like, what? I didn't even introduce myself. <laughs> Probably. Um, Anika. Yeah. Um, you are the co-owner of the Color Network, as we said before. Um, and I think it's very important that um, we have more, quite frankly, just black-owned entertainment uh, networks. Uh, and kind of, if you can chime in as well, what can we, say, black urban people, um, or just people of that world, of that culture, who kind of resonate with, the content that you're putting out what can we do more to support you yeah i think you know sharing sharing things from the channel doesn't cost a thing yeah. you know retweeting doesn't cost a thing and i think that's an easy way for people um people out there to support talk about it talk about it tell people you know follow us you know get our numbers up so that um we have more followers on all the different you platforms can that drop we're on the, yeah drop, drop yeah, the links so, now so, so yeah so um so on instagram um instagram and facebook we're at the color network and on twitter we're um the color net and so um that's color spelled uk way with a u <laughs> <laughs> so not like um how to spell it in america so yeah that's just an easy way to support um and yeah come to our events we've got an event on the 9th of September at Hackney Empire called the Black Magic Awards and the Black Magic Awards is an event where we're we're honouring women that have paved the way um, in black entertainment um, in the community in education in business etc so so yeah um, honouring the various women of colour in Britain yeah in Britain great yeah so British women of colour awesome (laughs) yeah and Annie kind of uh, similar with you as a filmmaker what can we do what can the audience do to help support uh you could more? join me at all the meetings i go to and every time somebody talks to me about when i'm ready to have a baby which will be soon at some point yeah. by the way um <laughs> uh and every time somebody speaks to me about color colorism what kind of topic is that uh, you can <laughs> kind of tell them where to go um uh, uh, no but really i think this, i think um uh, Annika said it really it's just about uh, you know spreading the word you know um, so kind of if you know people have to let us in through the door some way 
and it's great if you can connect us and keep the connection conversation going and yeah. kind of help us create a buzz um you know as independent filmmakers i think we rely on it because there's sometimes there's a sense of hmm does this person has this person chosen to be an, a writer director because they live a, a very kind of fulfilled life and they've decided to take up a hobby it's a it's a massive it's fantastic it's phenomenal it's it's what i was born to do but yeah. it's a massive undertaking and if it wasn't for the for people watching my films and kind of talking about them then you know yeah they would probably wouldn't have done as well as they have so yeah i just want to talk a little bit about just want to chime in on what we were talking about about the color network and uh i think it's fun, i think it's great what you're doing Thank um you. big up the color network um and it kind of reminds me of an amazing period of time in hip-hop around the 90s fantastic book uh written by my friend Nelson George called Hip Hop America. And it talks a lot about FUBU for us, by us, mm -hmm. and the history and the birthing of that brand, um, which went on at some point to kind of grow something like 352 million at one point, and Samsung was a key investor. Um, it was created for us, by us. Uh, it's now seeing a kind of new, interesting fashion uh, recycle i guess with the old 90s look which yeah. we were there from the beginning guys uh <laughs> so uh yeah there's there's a lot to be said about that amazing period of time that has magically reappeared as of the last two years with just i guess our consciousness has kind of i don't know enlightened or popular culture has led us there i'm not quite sure but you know the amazing solange album who i'm going to see next next month at the Dave Chappelle show but that album oh, cool. kind of massively oh, yeah amazing. I know I'm going to gonna go see Dave Chappelle I felt like I had a film meltdown at one point in my life so <laughs> uh, and he his words really saved me so I think uh, Solange Al Solange's album kind of you know spoke to a lot of women of color and made us feel very comforted yeah. um, and men of color that we were we weren't alone and there's a couple of tracks called weary and I'm mad that uh, really seemed to hit a nail when it came to last the last couple of years, what with Brexit and uh, just the at atrocities that have been happening in the US with with uh, shootings and more recently Grenfell. So, yeah. And kind of following on from that point, as um, content creators, broadly speaking, uh, what what um, objective, what um, yeah what objective do we have or what um what kind of push do we have to kind of show the our truth and speak our truth to this situation and to the times we're in um do you think there's a particular responsibility on us everyone across this table really um yeah but it's a good kind of responsibility yeah. it's not that crazy in crazy kind of t picking up that our ancestors and you know picking up our histories and how we came to be although there's an element of that that runs through you um but you know it's co it's cool to know a little bit about co post-coloniality and how you know how the world operates it's, it's a pretty cool subject um but I think there's yeah there is a responsibility there is a responsibility of people of, of color who are in positions of influence who are producers commissioners agents what have you you know it's not it's not necessarily about um waiting for that massive wave in that moment for somebody to tell you in the office it's okay for you to sort of give that person an opportunity yeah. it's about you know carving an opportunity if there's talent in front of you then you it they should be given a job it should be signed or given an opportunity to showcase their work because surely that's what that's what it's about it's about the work and how yeah. that connects with audiences and amazing game plays like netflix and amazon have changed you know have taken back the power a little bit which yeah. is which is interesting i think for studios and and broadcasters alike because yeah uh Anika, in kind of finding talent like uh, i know you've um you've uh now well the color network has produced like short films and like um it's got a news network um how do you source talent where can talent find you and i guess what um it's, it's not that hard to find talent because it's <laughs> out there it's and i think i think that's the problem is we can find talent easily so we, we sometimes look at tv or look at films and you think 
oh my god you're just always using the same people and there's so much there's a wealth of talent out there but yeah. people aren't they're just looking in the same places mm. whereas we're not looking in the same place and then also i think because people feel that we're a safe space to come to then talent's finding us as well so it's not really that difficult to do and i think you know is it an exciting time because you know we're no longer kind of like asking for a seat at the table just making our own table and saying you know yeah. you you come round if you want to be if you want to be part of this but we're not going to wait on you anymore and you know the technology that's out there has been able to give you know lots of people the opportunity to, to do that to you know put their short films out there online and put their web series online and then maybe you know maybe they'll make money from that because people actually you know whether it's through crowdfunding or people just wanting to say actually i like what you i like i like what you've done let me pay for that or a brand seeing that and being like actually we want to partner with you or or just you know you know like a film company or t- network like as in what's happened um with um Issa Rae and the awkward black girl kind of then mm-hmm. kind of lead into mm-hmm. insecure so um insecure being on tv so you know it, it's happening and and i think people aren't kind of waiting on you know the big the big boys to kind of you know co-sign them or to commission them anymore they're kind of just finding their own way you know if they if they come great if they don't it doesn't matter we're going to make it happen anyway and that's i guess um what's been happening at the color network so recently released um so my business partner kojo recently directed and wrote um short film called boys and another one called girls and you know there's going to be even more of that from from you know films to tv series that we're going to be releasing and working with lots of different um kind of aspiring and established content creators wonderful that's a really exciting it is really exciting times and just kind of sitting here and kind of uh, yeah that's kind of why i'd um um invited you down and thanks once again for coming down Thank and you. um in terms of uh producing film content broadly speaking um uh, how do you think or how have you found the best way to get funding to produce your work has been has it been through accessing grants or um crowdfunding or private investors i I don't know what or do they come at different stages have you felt um if you can both share Um, your experience on that yeah, uh, the great thing about going to the National Film and Television School um, uh, and not going there as a 21-year-old is I knew that it was a twofold experience that I was going there to kind of learn my craft, so to speak, but also, or hone in my, in my craft, but also make films using yeah. the school's equipment and trial and error. And so um, that was a huge benefit. Pre that, it was crowdfunding. And, you know, the the classic three f's friends fools and family um but i think that uh more and more the recent collaboration i I did with the hospital club in vulcan productions where i shot uh, a short in la which follows the story of uh well funnily enough follows the story of dreamers and artists trying to make it but kind of going through a personal jihad every single day because they're struggling with rent with life with expectation with being 30 something so you know a bit like my life um so what was dope about that experience is that um you know pitching an idea there's a brand there that uh wants to tell authored stories by uh an independent filmmaker doesn't really want the massive and massive cost that comes with going to an agency and it was great to just pitch like the with the big boys and just get the job land the job and go out there and shoot so i think you know we're a great we're at a great time because you, you you can make a film for next to nothing so don't ever forget that and just yeah. spend a lot of money in the grade like kanye west the one yeah. i think or something like that one of his music videos that was directed by the guy who made her whose name escapes me but anyway it was, it was all shot on an on an iphone um so we are at a great time but let's not but it you're always kind of at the same time you're always compared to your last work and you've got to manage that ego a little bit because it can make you feel fearful about going again and going on, you know, 200 pound budget and trying to make it happen. So uh, we are at a great time, but uh, but it's also a great opportunity to galvanize and create partnerships, especially for me as a writer director. You know, I'd love to tell a story that's uh, funded by an ethical brand or a brand that I admire and I respect. because I still get to do my job, 
Yeah. I still and I get to produce it as well, and you know, yeah, it's a, it's a strong sense of ownership over around it, but also I get the money to make it, which is quite important. Yeah, because we can't lose sight of the fact that without funding we can't make stuff. I mean, we can yeah. make kind of relatively okay stuff, but not you know we can't uh, really keep the audience in the palm of our hands as well as others with massive production yeah. money. Yeah. Has anybody seen Dunkirk? Not yet. No. I do want to see it. Because no. I was like an interest. That's an interesting film. But I was just talking about production and I was thinking about. I watched Dunkirk and Girls Trip back to back. I think okay. they're both important films. Yeah. Everybody should be supporting them, particularly Girls Trip. Um, <laughs> but a hundred, a hundred million was that was the budget for um, Dunkirk. Yeah. Hundred million. Wow. And I was like, well, I'll make a hundred films. I know. <laughs> just give me a million. <laughs> and Girl, Girl Trip was like what about twenty twenty three million? Yeah, quite, like what, yeah. must Sounds be around there. That, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's I mean, it's not going to be a hundred million, but yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of um, like we've seen recently in the last uh, few years, like uh, very talented black British actors kind of go to um, America and kind of make their way, and I wanted to kind of get both of your thoughts on. Do you think? Do you think America or Britain, which is more progressive for black actors, um, America or Britain? Well, I guess obviously it's going to be America because that's why there's so many black actors going to America. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I don't know whether this is true, but what, from what I hear, they say, um, you know, the industry says that they like black British actors because they're quite good at picking up different accents and obviously a lot of them are classically trained. And so... Um, you know, and obviously you, we can see that there's there's been many that are kind of you know doing the damn thing over there, and and a lot of time Americans. It's so funny because I've watched a lot of kind of videos online where Americans then find out that the person's British, like watching an interview with yeah. them. They're like, <laughs> like because they didn't even realize that um, that actor or actress was um British in the first place. But I guess you know I, it always comes back to stories, doesn't it? And the kind of and in the UK, they haven't, you know, I guess they haven't been giving kind of black actors the opportunity and the stories to be able to showcase their talent. And so essentially they're going to end up going abroad if that if the opportunities aren't there. Um, there. There is a lot to be said about the amount of actors that flock to the US and having just come back, you know, it's an easy conversation. Pitching is, you know, you've got to be at the ready, but nobody really cares like about your parents an ancestry it's not really a big deal it's right. can you make money is your story gonna suit fit an audience and so you're, t you're t then you start uh come you know then you start you know when you're pitching they're thinking metrics and audience and numbers and diaspora yeah. and that's what the conversation should always be about um Riz Ahmed is doing quite well out there yeah, yeah. Up yeah. um talented yeah talented. yeah talented. hugely and um uh, but but you got to remember, for every Idris Elba and for every Riz, there there are, you know, un there's a lot that who who aren't getting the work because people tend to go with, you know, try to book the same actor over and over again. Um, Do you think um, that um, I I guess the exodus of uh, black British actors over to America is something unique onto itself, or it fits in with actually a lot of white British actors in recent years have been doing very well in Hollywood. Is it part all part and parcel of the same thing, or is there something specifically unique to the reason black British actors are going and making it successful as opposed to the rest? Well, there are hu there are huge numbers of Af uh, African American uh, Latinos uh, and the in betweens, as I call us a lot um so uh there there the the num the numbers are out are there really but um yeah the, i guess i i guess america's always had an appreciation for actors um heading out there to the states and kind of making it um and ov obviously uh hollywood is one of the biggest movie if not the biggest movie capital of the world so you know the work is there there are six studios, six agencies, and everybody au auditioning all day, every day, literally. Yeah. Um, I mean, why are you going to sit in a country, can constantly go to 
castings and you're probably not going to get the job and so there's only so much of that people can take when they go to yeah. America and, yeah. and yeah. they're more likely to get the job. Yeah. So at the end of the day, we've all got to eat, we've all got bills to pay yeah. and everybody wants to be able to realise their passions. So if they're able to do that in America and if England doesn't realise their, their talent, then you're going to do it. I mean, Idris was here a long time before he went yeah. to America. Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember him on that Channel 5 soap. What was it called? Um, Oh, gosh. The soap that he was in, Family Affairs. Family oh, Affairs, wow. yes. Affairs. I remember Family, family Affairs. affairs. I remember Family no, Affairs. No one was looking at Idris then. <laughs> um, yeah, gosh, that was a long time. I actually remember Family Affairs. Um, and and I think uh, also um, to add to that, that, there is this kind of, like I said, you go there, people just don't care. Does your story yeah. work? Does it fit? Great, we're here to make money. There's an audience. So there is no, you know, it's only like Annika says, there's only so much rejection one can handle as an artist. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It, you kind of have to get into a, onto the right kind of altitude. And I certainly went out there and I felt like, yeah, you know, they there are some old school people that just really don't, you know, it's a whole new concept of woman who's a writer director, who's not middle class and didn't go to a private school and isn't white. It's a whole new thing for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and in the States it was, I was kind of, I felt, like I was embraced that's not to say that no you know I have had that kind of reception here you know by by other production companies and commissioners and producers but you know it is I'd say it's it's yeah it's more obvious over there that you can okay. actually fit in and make the work and I guess over here as well I mean diversity is still an issue in America in America as well you know obviously it's only recently they had the you know the Oscars so white and yeah. kind of other things and they've got I guess lots of initiatives and happening over there but I think one of the things that helps of America is that if they do do programs with kind of people of color in at least they know how to market it yeah. they might they might underestimate it because they might not buy enough seats in the cinema or you know put it out for as long as it should have been but they know how to market it. Whereas over here, I find that the, one of the problems is, is that they never know how to market films um, with people of color in and that ends up being the problem. Or uh -huh. again, they underestimate it and then don't give enough seats and then you, you wanna go and support the film, but you can't yeah. even find a cinema to go and watch it at in the first place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And But this year alone has proved that actually it's about good stories with yeah. Moonlight, with Hidden Figures, with Girls Trip. Yeah. You know, it's about just, give us the right stories and it doesn't it doesn't matter we we sit in cinemas watching you know films with complete white casts or you know you can watch a film film with complete asian cast it doesn't matter if it's a good story we're gonna we'll want to go and see it and it shouldn't make a difference if you know the cast is all black or cast is all it's about the stories and just giving people that opportunity wow it's uh all about stories and opportunity yeah <laughs> that's, that's it that's pretty much it um so what are you two up to now what does how does the feature look like for both of you um what projects are you working on um i'm working on my feature um which i'm really looking forward to making um and i can't say much about it right now mm -hmm. but um uh yeah i think it's gonna be visceral and energetic and unexpected so i'm really enjoying pitching it um yeah. as much as possible um i've also developed a, a series so uh but i am reworking it so what's the series can you divulge no, that in film? Okay, no. this is what <laughs> happened this is what yeah no i can't oh, i can't but i will be, you'll be the first to know well, thank you'll you. be one of the first to know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and i've got a series of short stories called coconut and other stories which is coming out in september uh which is self-published a uh, series of shorts so yeah and first up so i mentioned the black magic awards earlier so that's yeah. on september the night at hackney empire got performances there by Damage. We're doing oh, a tribute wow. to wow. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. Throwing it back. <laughs> throwing Damage. It back. Ghetto um, romance. We've got yeah. one, <laughs> one of our honorees is Jamelia. And oh, so nice. I don't know if you all remember, obviously. Yeah. A lot of people don't, re they see her on TV, but a lot of people don't remember that actually she started up as a singer. So we're actually doing a Jamelia tribute where we've yeah. got um, a singer called Cherry V, another yeah, singer yeah, called yeah. Rachel Kerr and Tiana Major Nine who are going to do a Jamelia tribute singing kind of superstar 
um, thank you and you know, Jamelia songs. We've got a spoken word cipher that's going to happen there. Spoken um, word cipher. Word cipher. cipher. <laughs> yes, I love the word um, cipher. A performance by this young girl that's kind of gone viral called Princess K. Um, so yeah, it's hosted by um, comedian Eddie Caddy and um, mm-hmm. presenter called Annalise Days, who presents on Heart of Feminine was in Britain's Next Top Model back in the day. So it's going to be a really fabulous night of kind of glamour and entertainment. So that's the kind of big thing that I'm working on. And then obviously then it's just kind of day to day general business of kind of keeping things updated on the Colour Network website and kind of creating content and things. So I'm trying to write one. I'm supposed to be working with a director to write a web series and nudge, kind nudge, of, wink, uh, wink. yeah basically yeah i've missed, <laughs> I've missed the deadline writing deadline because yeah. i've just been so busy with everything else but you know god willing that will that will happen as well and i also have a podcast as well called queens and dreams which is oh, a, nice a female empowerment podcast so you can just look, listen to that on queens obviously com kind of thing so yeah it's a kind of hub for women yeah. So, um, How's like Queens and Dreams? Is it? Do you use the Z or the S? I don't really have Queens that. spelled um normally N, and then it's instead N. of and it's the letter N, yeah. and then Dreams. So Queens and Dreams dot com, and you can um so I do that with my girl Mary Bello. So um, she's a fellow journalist. Awesome. And uh, just lastly, your social media links. Where can we follow, like, subscribe, share your stuff? Well, um, you can find me at. Anika Allen um, on everything Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, wherever it's all Anika Allen. So that's Anika spot A N N I K A Allen with an E, so two L's and an E. I'm Annie Laurie at Annie Laurie, the only Annie you'll ever meet. Spelled A N I. Laurie is in who you Laurie. I don't know about Instagram. I came off that two years ago. I just, I just need someone I, to I saw your entice me back yesterday. on the gram. I know. I took yeah, the picture yeah. of it. I'm just like, not going to do it. Don't Instagram respond to requests. Best. And I'm just, yeah, I've had a good life actually since getting off. But, um, but I do miss the, uh, the only really, the only stuff I really miss are photographs by the cinematographer Tuvo, who shot uh, Birdman and. Uh, the one with Tom Hardy that came out last year that I don't remember what that was about indigenous tribe which I'm all about um, The Revenant ah. Chivo so that Chivo yeah he's pretty pretty sick pictures what made you come off Instagram oh you'd have to like me story. on your podcast to tell you okay. we'll do that we'll it do might that. be actually good a related Very women good. issue okay <laughs> um, we'll, we'll get you on there then <laughs> Um, Anika and Annie um, I just wanted to say a big thank you for coming down to the Big Picture Film Club podcast thanks for Um, having us thank you big up Big Picture you've been told us what's next for you when's the next Big Picture Um, so our next event is the 6th of September that's it that sounds about right yeah (laughs) Um, so that's at the um, Close Up Film Centre in Shoreditch East London and um, it's um uh, again we kind of do like um themed collections mm-hmm. so uh, our next theme is um hidden world mm-hmm. and it's collections of stories dealing with people who on the surface have everyday lives like you wouldn't uh, you know you, you wouldn't uh, necess- they wouldn't stand out to you but there is something going on beyond that veneer that's interesting that's out of the ordinary mm. and all of these short stories explore that out of the ordinary situation nice. yeah. sounds great big up big Can't picture wait. thank mm-hmm. you fresh thank you Avisha. thank you Annika. yes thank you thank you <laughs>